So welcome back to all of you to this uh, final session. So we zero in on the concept of uh, performance management and control. Performance management and control. So what is performance management and control all about? Well, we have uh, the aspects here from the syllabus that what we're expected to do is to evaluate the strengths and the weaknesses of alternative budgeting models. Alternative budgeting models. What are these alternative budget models? The fixed and the flexible, the rolling budget, activity based budget, zero based budget, and incremental budgeting. That is one aspect. So, what we expected here is to describe or to evaluate in terms of what are the advantages and disadvantages of these approaches. What are the advantages and disadvantages of these approaches? And also once able to recommend which approach would be suitable. Which approach would be suitable? After that, we've got evaluation of variances. the different types of variances and how these relate to learning and controlling of an organization. So these are two aspects, evaluating the different approaches to budgeting and also evaluating the type of variances that we use and how we can improve on the variance analysis system. Okay, so let us uh, look at these items now. Let's look at these items. Let's look at these items. The various budgeting approaches, the various budgeting approaches or approaches to budgeting. Let's see what we can say about them. Here we go. <clears throat> so when we look at budgets, where do we, where do they come in? Here's where they come in. In our last lecture last week, we spoke about from the mission statements, we develop strategic objectives, which are all about how to achieve the mission. From the strategic objectives, we can now develop 
the strategic plans, how the objectives will be pursued. From strategic plans, we go to budgets. And these are now short-term plans and targets for us to achieve the objectives. So this is the kind of thinking that we have on this course that you the mission is the ultimate goal that we want to achieve. But for you to operationalize your mission, to now convert it into what can be done on a short-term basis, we need the budgets. So budgets are some are also part of our hierarchy that we have been talking about. So our budgets are part of our hierarchy. And they come at the tail end of this hierarchy. We'll be asked to evaluate the budgeting tool. In other words, we'll be asked to talk about what are the advantages for a company of adopting a tool called budgeting. What are the benefits to a company? Well, through the budgeting, we ensure that organization objectives are met. Budgeting compels planning. Organizations are forced to plan when they adopt budgeting. The budget helps to communicate ideas and plans. The budget also helps to coordinate the activities of everybody in the organization. You can coordinate the manufacturing, marketing, HR, these cannot be coordinated by the budgets which are passed from one budget center to the next. Budgets help to allocate the scarce resources in the organization. An approved budget authorizes us to spend. Budgets provide a framework for responsibility accounting. The budgeting system or centers, those budget centers, the budget centers, become responsibility centers. So those budget centers based on which you prepare budgets, when you, produce, when you introduce responsibility accounting, those centers become responsibility centers. So there's no need for you to figure out other type of centers. Budgets are used for control. They're used for evaluation of performance with all the management styles. And also it's a tool that can be used to motivate employees by coming up with incentives for those who have achieved their budgets. Let's look at the alternative approaches. Let's look at alternative approaches. How can we approach the budgeting we can use an incremental approach. What does this involve? We take as, as a starting point, the current results. The current results. 
That's a starting point. And on top of this, what do we do? We add. We add a proportion for growth, expected growth. And inflation. Then we have a budget. So we take the current results and you add growth and inflation. Then you have a budget. This uh, approach is good if you were operating in a stable, predictable environment. If you're operating in an environment which is very stable, An environment which is predictable, if that is your nature of your business, if uh, you are very efficient, you are operating at your most efficient level, stable environment, predictable environment, you are very efficient, your operations reflect the highest level of efficiency. We say that this system is good. The only problem is that if uh, your starting point reflects inefficiency, if your starting point is weak, then you're saying the budgets that you produce will equally be weak. They will equally be very weak. The budgets are to produce also carry forward all the weaknesses, all the inefficiencies. That's a challenge that you have. So how can you improve on your incremental budgeting? You try zero-based budgeting where you start from the scratch. Every time you budget, you start from the scratch. Eh? as though an activity is being done for the first time. So you start from the zero base. So nothing is approved till every item is justified. So a zero base budget is good because everything would have been justified, but certainly it will take a lot of time. Eh? If you're operating in a very dynamic environment, environment which is changing very fast, you must adopt a rolling budget or a continuous budget approach, where we roll or data budgets at agreed intervals, maybe every month, every quarter. So every time we sit down at agreed intervals and we update our budgets accordingly. For instance, if we update every quarter. So we've got two quarter, four quarters in 2022. So we are running the first quarter. As the first quarter is ending, what happens? We come here, we extend, we add another quarter there. And then this quarter, we improve on it. We convert it into a concrete budget. So that's what we'll be doing every quarter. We take out an area period and add another one. For the one which is coming, we update it. There's a system of updating your budgets regularly. Of course, it's a lot of work. Eh? But we have no choice. If you operate in an environment which is very dynamic, if you operate in an environment which is very dynamic, you have no choice but to continuously update your budgets. That is a recommendation. Controllability. Controllability. 
we need in our performance reports to include items that are controllable. Control B, it must be observed. And this is where flexible budgeting comes in because you contrast fixed and flexible budgets. Fixed and flexible budgets. Budgets which are prepared only with one level of activity in mind. Not designed to change with changes in activities. That's a fixed budget. And the variances from there may not be as meaningful. So how can we make our variances more meaningful? Answer, can you flex the budget? If your original budget that you prepared was for 8,000 units, and when you come to operate, notice that the actual was 120,000 units. The argument is that this original budget is no longer useful. We need to take this budget and flex it. This budget must now be flexed. We need to prepare another budget. For 120,000. So we've got the actual. So we flex our budget. And once we flex our budget, our variances, our variances will be acceptable. And the, this becomes, it, does, it will motivate employees. It becomes easier to manage now because we have got variances which are meaningful meaningful variances. So flexing your budget is an approach which helps us to improve on the aspect of controllability. Organizations that have introduced activity-based costing. Organizations that have introduced activity-based costing, they have already split their organization into one, activities mm, and also cost drivers. You have already arranged your organization in terms of activities and cost drivers. And therefore, when it comes to budgeting also, the simple question is, why don't we use the same activities? So you budget on the basis of activities. You already know the cost driver. So use the cost drivers in estimating the costs. Budgeting on the basis of activities helps us to eliminate non-value adding activities. We'll make sure that all non-value adding activities are not allocated any resources. So that is what is expected. So you find that if you are, you are asked what to calculate or to prepare an activity-based budget, you find yourself doing activity-based costing again. I recently met a question which say, how can an activity-based budget help on variance analysis? 
as compared to, trad to traditional budgeting. Yeah. <clears throat> It can help, it can help. Um, the quality of the variances will be much better. The quality of the variances or variance analysis is much better, why? Because you are budgeting on the basis of the cost drivers. You are budgeting on the basis of cost drivers. So the budgets that you prepare under kit-based costing are much more realistic. Because look at this, when uh, you are asked to cut a budget, eh, to reduce, you, you cut on a, an expenditure budget. Eh? Traditionally, you may do that subjectively or reduce all the costs by 10%. Now imagine you have reduced all the costs by 10%. Is the budget realistic? This budget may not be realistic. Because to just an overall cut of 10. But if you say, go and re review the cost drivers, look at how many drivers are being reflected in the budget and go and change the drivers. It means that your budget will be much more realistic. If you want to control costs, you don't say 10%, no, you say, Go and reduce the number of cost drivers. Go and review the cost drivers. So the variances that we get are much more realistic because in the budgets are more realistic. They are based on the cost drivers. So can you, okay, can you also identify variances which are due to non-value adding activities? Can also, yes, please, that's another item. It on zero based budgeting. So somebody says, uh, let's talk about zero based budgeting again. Let's talk about zero based budgeting again. So, zero based budgeting, the basis is incremental budgeting. We are saying that incremental budgeting has a weakness. If uh, the starting point is not efficient, if a starting point is not efficient, then you're going to carry forward problems. Let's give an example. <clears throat> We're doing a fuel budget. Eh? I'm sure it's a common budget, fuel. So we ask ourselves, how much have we spent on fuel this year? Oh, I've spent $40,000. That's how much I've spent. So I say, oh, next year, what inflation are we expecting to add inflation? Uh, what growth do you expect in activities? You add the percentage from growth. You have an incremental budget. But what we're saying is that, is this really correct? This 40,000, does it reflect fuel which went into business activity? Or maybe there was a, a huge element of personal usage. So to avoid this problem, we say, let's budget from a zero base. Let's start from the scratch and ask ourselves, how many liters of fuel do we need? For all these activities that we want to undertake. No, last year we spent the 40,000, forget about that, first of all, let's look at what would we need. So we are building a, bit, a budget from a zero base. Or if you say, no, we cannot throw this figure, say, okay, we are going to account for every liter that went in here to see really whether it, was, it went into business, which is as good as starting from zero base. So you start, your budgeting from a zero base every time. And the, every liter has to be justified of fuel. Then we can build a budget. So the inefficiencies that were to be carried forward, we can eliminate them.
Another approach to allow participation is should we do top down or bottom up? So we can uh, do an imposed style. Sometimes, depending on what the organization is going through, that may be a better approach. A top down approach may be a better approach, especially if the organizations are going through a very difficult time. There's so much uncertainty. We are saying a top down approach may be very, maybe okay. Or if we don't have the time, we need to move quickly and come up with the budget, a top down may be okay. But ideally, logic would tell us that a bottom up is better. You build a budget, a budget from the bottom and you go up. So that is an approach that we can use. Okay, so these are the approaches to budgeting that can be used. And you've got the advantages and disadvantages of all these approaches there, which you can go through. Lastly, let's talk about our variances. Let's talk about our variances. So, variance analysis. We have been asked to evaluate variances. How can we evaluate variances? How can we come up with the, a better variance analysis system? There are three things we can talk about. Number one, what all this is showing us is that when we are asked to evaluate a variance analysis system, if we ask to evaluate, one, if we're given total variances, total variances are not very meaningful. So one thing we can do is break down the total variance into individual variances. And that's what we are showing here. Total labor variance should be split into usage and price. The sales variance you do have a volume and a price. The labor variance, total labor variance will be split into efficiency and rate. Variable rate, total variance might be split into expenditure and efficiency. Fixed over a total variance is split into expenditure and volume and the volume is further split into efficiency and capacity. So <clears throat> this summary helps you to remember some of you by this time you have forgotten the breakdown of variances. It helps us that a total variance is not very meaningful for performance appraisal. What do we need? We need a breakdown, a sub-analysis. A sub-analysis is very important. Secondly, in addition to breaking down the variance, the flexing of budgets helps to improve the usefulness. So we can improve your variance analysis. So in your evaluation, you must ask the question, are we comparing like with like? We want to suggest the flexing of budgets. The original budget was for, we saw earlier on, 80,000 units. The actual was for one twenty was one twenty thousand. This budget, which you prepared at the beginning, is no longer relevant. 
you need to flex it. So, how can we improve on variance analysis? It's by flexing the budget so that we have meaningful variances. Thirdly, how can we further improve our variance analysis system? We can further improve on our variance analysis system by bringing the concept of planning and operational variances. Planning and operational variances. In other words, very close to flexing of budgets, the original plan that we prepare may have been overtaken by events. The original plan may no longer be useful, so I want to revise it. And then that's where we can bring in the action. So the difference between the original plan that you prepared and the revised is what we call a planning variance. The difference between the revised and the actual is what we call the operations variance. Now, some of you may say, but what's the difference in a flexible budget and planning operations approach? We flex mainly because of activity. When we are flexing, we flex a budget because of changes in activity. The original activity was 80,000. The actual activity is 120,000. So we are flexing this budget. But here we are saying a lot more may have changed. Prices may have changed. Inflation rates may have changed. Exchange rate may have changed. There may have been new technologies as well. So when you are planning and operations is done, not just because of changing activity, but a whole lot of factors. Okay, somebody was commenting on my screen here. Yeah. So the planning and operations approach, we need to distinguish between variances which are caused by inaccurate planning or 40 standards or unrealistic standards and those which are caused by operational performance being better or worse than expected operational balances. So we can improve our variance analysis system by introducing the concept of planning and operations variance. We can improve our variance analysis system by bringing in flexible budgets. We can improve our variance system by sub-analyzing the variances. Sub-analyzing the variances. So these three can help you to improve your system of variances. So when you are evaluating, you're asked to evaluate a variance, all we are saying is that these variances, are they controllable? Are they based on standards that are correct?
Are they based on the standards that are realistic? This will enable us to evaluate whether our variances are meaningful or not. Yeah, can we explain sub-analysis? This is breakdown of variances. Sub-analysis means the material variance, the material variance should be sub-analyzed into what? Price and usage. The labor variance must be broken down into efficiency and rate. So sub-analysis involves taking a total variance and breaking it into its components. Yeah. Well, we get to the last item. The last item is what I promised that I would do, and that's, that was the concept of transfer pricing. So we spend uh, some time now. We'll spend some time now. Let's run through our the concept of the transfer pricing. So what is transfer pricing? So let's say go to the concept of transfer pricing. Okay. So that is uh, the item that you are going to end with. The concept of transfer pricing. So we look at the concept of transfer pricing. So what is transfer pricing? Eh? How does transfer pricing arise? And what are the examinable issues as far as transfer pricing is concerned? So transfer pricing is an internal pricing system. Transfer pricing is an internal pricing system, which arises when we have introduced the concept of responsibility accounting. So when you have introduced responsibility accounting, it becomes inevitable that you also introduce transfer pricing. Where there's a transfer of goods and services, where there's a transfer of goods and services, between divisions, it's possible they could be made for free. Mm -hmm. When one division transfers a component to the next division, one can argue that if these are one company, why don't we just transfer for free? The answer is yes, that's a possibility, isn't it? It's possible. But why do we need a system of transfer pricing? It is necessary for control purposes, for control. That some record of the market in interdivision of goods or services is kept. Let me ask you a question. If uh, division A transfers a component to the division B, and it was for free. What would be the attitude of B in handling? What attitude do you expect? They may be careless, eh? because they got it for free. If there's responsibility accounting, what are they going to record for the work that you have done? How much work? What is the value of the work? What is the value of the work that has been done? We never know the value of the work that has been done. So how do we evaluate performance at the end of the day? What will be the effect overall on the company performance? 
you agree with me that you were likely to have uh, not very good performance at the top at the end of the day. If we entertain a system of free transfer. Or you can argue that then we are killing the idea behind responsibility accounting. That whole idea or the expected benefit of uh, responsibility accounting, you are killing it and you won't get a full benefit. of the system of responsibility accounting. We're not going to get the full benefit. The price at which goods or services are transferred from one department to another or from one member of a group to another is what we call transfer price. So transfer price is an internal pricing system. Let's come to your exam. In the exam, we ask from time to time to evaluate. So your exam is not about describing, no, but you must have to evaluate. So let's see how we evaluate the transfer pricing system. How do we evaluate the transfer pricing system? A good transfer pricing system should support go congruence. A good transfer pricing system should lead to what? Corporate profit maximization. Overall corporate profit maximization. I can give you an example. We have got our two divisions, A and B. Eh? We've got our two divisions, A and B. We've got our two divisions, A and B. Eh? Division A and Division B. Division A transfers to its component to B. That's what happens. Okay. Now, uh, division A is asking for hundred dollars, and B says, "No, I can't pay hundred dollars. I'm going to buy in from somebody outside who's selling at ninety dollars." I'm going to buy in. And yet, this product costs an, the organization $80 to make in terms of the variable cost. So, in terms of variable cost, we spend $80. Now, what's the impact of this decision? What's the impact of this decision? The impact of this decision is that our organization is now spending $90 because the transfer price which has been set is not appropriate. So instead of us spending only 80, we're now spending 90. This is, this is in, eating in corporate profit. The, co the overall corporate profits are being affected. Why? Because of our transfer pricing policy. A good transfer price, therefore, should support go congruence or what we call overall corporate profit maximization. A good transfer price should also support fair performance appraisal. Fair performance appraisal. The transferring division, receiving division, the transferring division and the receiving division can have their performance fairly assessed. 
the ones that are transferring and those that are receiving. A good transfer price system should also respect autonomy. The head office should not impose the price. No? Head office should not impose price, no. Allow the participating divisions to decide. You can also add that in a multinational, in a multinational, a good transfer pricing system must be designed in such a way that we minimize the tax liability. In a multinational, a good transfer pricing system should be arranged in such a way that it will minimize the tax liability. We must minimize the tax liability. A good transfer pricing system also should be formalized. It must be transparent. So these are additional aspects that we can talk about. The four main aspects are go congruence, fair performance of appraisal, autonomy, uh, the issue of tax and multinational, and other aspects could include, we need to formalize the system and also we need to be transparent. Near the point 30, I have explained here. Okay. These are the points that we have explained here. Every month's appraisal, autonomy. So I've explained these points. Now the next question is how do you set the, how do you set the transfer price? Two main methods. Market-based transfer price and the cost-based transfer price. So these are the two approaches that you can use. How do they work? Let us go through how they work. <clears throat> so if you are invited that please help us to set a transfer price. If you are invited to set a transfer price. The first question is, is there an external market? If an external market exists for transferred goods, then the transfer price could be set at the external market price. So if a product has got an external market, if a product has got an external market, the external market price becomes the starting point. The external market becomes the starting point. The external market becomes the starting point. So the approach works this way. You ask a question, is there an external market for the good or service? If the, question, the answer says yes, you ask the next question. What is the extent of the external market? How many people are there? What volumes are you talking about? We're given the number. Then from there, you ask the last question. How does it compare with the, the internal production capacity? You need to answer the, to ask these three questions before you can decide what you're going to use as a transfer price. Let's follow it up here. Let's use an illustration. Let's use an illustration to deal with this.
we go. We have three scenarios. Scenario A, scenario B, and scenario C. Is there an external market for the good or service? The answer is yes. What is the external market? 700, 900, 1, 2. These are three scenarios. What is the extent of the external market demand? 700, 900, 1, 2. Next, how does it compare with internal capacity? Our capacity is 1,000. So what is the spare capacity? 300, 100. So here is spare capacity. Here, there is no spare capacity. So then let us advise on the transfer price. There's the surplus of 300. And internally, internally, there's a request for how many items? 200. And you've got surplus 300. So the question is, in this case, can you use the external market price? The answer is no. These items that are being requested, they have got no external market. We have a spare of 300. So what would be the suitable transfer price? The minimum transfer price here will simply be the variable cost for this item. And if you have any, any opportunity cost. So these 200 items do not have an external market, no. Because of the surplus or spare capacity. Now number two. Here, our internal capacity is 1,000, again, as usual, but demand is 900. So only have a balance of 100 units, a surplus. But there's a request for 200. What are you going to do? These first 100, these first 100, they have no market. So these first 100, we are going to deliver them at the minimum of variable cost, plus an opportunity cost. But the balance now, we can talk about an external market. So there's going to be the first 100 variable cost plus opportunity cost. The other 100, external market price. What of scenario number three? In scenario number three, the demand exceeds our capacity. We don't have any spare capacity. We even have a shortfall. So all these 200, if they're going to be transferred internally, if they're going to be transferred internally, this, they'll all be at it external market price. Why? Because these have a market. Is there an adjustment? Yes. When you sell in denary, when you sell in denary, like in this case, products which have got adequate external demand, we still give a small discount. We still give a small discount. We still give the same a small discount. Why? Because of the internal nature of the transaction. So even when there's adequate external market like here, when you sell internally, Please give a small discount.
reflect the internal nature of the transaction. And that's what we call adjusted market price. So in your evaluation, if you ever find that there was a transfer price based on the external market, and there was no discount given, you must point out that, that this is something that didn't happen well here. We are supposed to give a small discount. Remember, your questions are evaluating. You need to evaluate. We need to evaluate. So when you're evaluating, you look at what the company has done, and then check if there's anything in favor and against. Advantage of market-based transfer price. The company's performance will not be impacted negatively by the transfer price because the transfer price is the same as the external market price. The transfer should be deemed to be fair by the managers of the buying and selling divisions. The selling division will receive the same amount for any, for any internal or external sale. The buying division will pay the same for goods if they buy them internally or externally. So really, where there's an external market, When there's an external market, and that external market demand is adequate, is so much, base your transfer price on the external market price and give a small adjustment. Now, somebody says that uh, if uh, you have got spare, you have got the spare capacity. And all the items can be transferred internally from that spare capacity. What are you going to use? Viable cost plus an opportunity cost. What is opportunity cost? If there's anything else that you could have done, if there's anything else that you could have done with that space that you have used to make the product, if there's any benefit for gone, you must add it to arrive at the minimum transfer price, which is acceptable. If the opportunity cost is zero, if there's no opportunity cost, then this will just be zero. But in terms of the guide, we say, you must take the variable cost plus any opportunity cost, any foregone benefit. And sometimes we find that the foregone benefit is zero. So just put a zero there. And remember, this also is just a minimum. Eh? The two parties can now decide how much you can put on top of that minimum. So our guide is that where there is adequate spare capacity, which will not temper with external demand, the minimum transfer price. is the variable cost that you spend plus any benefit that you have forgone. This is simply the minimum. The actual transfer price may be out of the negotiation. The person who asked the question, is that okay? What are the limitations of the market-based transfer price? Oh, the market-based transfer price is the best, isn't it? It's the one that we'd love to use. But there may be no external market. Or there may be no equivalent external market. So how do you proceed? Or the external market may simply be temporal. It's seasonal. So what external price are you going to adopt? if we have seasonal prices. You know, the use of external market price also may act as a disincentive 
to utilizing spare capacity. Because I know that if um, I use full capacity, what will happen? I'm going to have some surplus, which according to the rules that you have covered, the surplus can only be sold at what? Viable cost plus opportunity cost. So what will I do? I will not work at full capacity. I'll reduce my capacity. There's external market imperfections such as discounts. So how are we going to treat discounts? When adopting an external price, the question is, what do you do about the discounts? Hmm? How are you going to factor them in? Savings may be made from transferring internally. How do you deal with these savings? We have seen already that you need to give a discount, but how much discount are you going to give from the savings? Where we don't have an external market, you don't have a choice, but just to tend to cost. And when you tend to cost, you can either use actual cost or standard cost. So A is transferring to B. Mm -hmm. And there's no external component for this component called A. So what do we do? We just focus on the cost. What was the cost that they spent? What was the cost? We can either use the actual cost or standard cost. Now in evaluation, what is the recommended approach? What is the recommended? The recommended is to use a standard cost. That cost should be used rather than the actual cost since actual cost not encourage selling division to control their cost. If a standard cost is used, the bank division will know the cost in advance and can therefore put plans in place. So in a, in a transfer pricing system, where we use costs, in order to improve the performance of the company, you must use standard costs. That's what you must use. This cost can be a marginal cost, purely marginal cost, or it can be a full cost. Or it can be marginal cost plus a small markup, or full cost plus a small markup. So these are versions of costs that you can use. These are the versions of costs that you can use. If you don't have an external market. Okay, so uh, I'm going to throw these slides on our forum so that you can access them. You can run through them when you run through the presentation on the concept of who? transfer pricing. So if you ask to evaluate the transfer price, remember the basis for evaluation. Hmm? This is your best basis for evaluation. If you are evaluating a market-based transfer price, remember to always give a small discount on the external market price. If you are evaluating a transfer price, which is cost-based, remember that we encourage you to use the standard cost. And not the actual cost. So that is the approach that we must use. 
Okay, people, so this is um, how far we go on um, our revision. We have covered the, a number of items today. We've covered a number of items today. We have managed to review a number of items. Of course, on a program like this one, you may not really exhaust everything per se. It's impossible to exhaust everything per se. Our syllabus is quite wide, but we have substantially dealt with a number of items. We've substantially dealt with a number of items in area A of the syllabus, in area B of the syllabus, in area D of the syllabus, in area E of the syllabus. We have dealt with the, a substantial number of items. I'm sure this now is um, started you to continue running with your question practice. Okay, so that you, um, you are able to get ready for your examinations. Okay, it was quite a very good group. I think with a lot of comments, I could see the comments that were coming through the chats. Uh, the participation was very, very good. Okay, through the chats, we're able to get um, some feedback. Okay, so please. Um, Let's continue interacting. Let's continue interacting. You have my details now. My details are all here. I teach uh, performance management. Okay, I teach uh, financial management. I teach advanced performance management. I teach advanced financial management. So these on SCC are my specializations. Of course, I teach on other programs as well. When it comes to SCCA, this is what I've specialized in. Yeah, and the, uh, I've been around since 1994 when I started training with ACCA. I've trained uh, students in different, you know, work in Botswana. I've done some work for ACCA in Swaziland, in Soto, South Africa. So internally now we see us still doing the teaching. And it was a pleasure to talk to a wide group of students from all over. Eh? The whole of Africa. We thank SCCA for this. We hope that next time they can arrange another opportunity like this so that we can support students across Africa. Yeah. But in case you have any questions or you need any support, if you want me to review your work, okay, if you want me to review your work and give you a feedback, please, my details are here. Just to drop me an email or WhatsApp is the easiest so that I can give you whatever support you may be looking for. Okay? Yeah. Otherwise, it was a very good group of students. It was a pleasure to meet you on your journey to qualify. Uh, we're going to throw this presentation on the forum. So I'll put the links, I think late in the evening tonight, I'll put the link so that you can access it via your YouTube. So from the YouTube, you can pick it up and try to quickly review the points that have gone through together. The notes on transfer pricing, I'll throw them here as well. The notes on transfer pricing and also notes on risk and uncertainty, I'll throw them on our forum. So don't leave the forum so that you can access all this information. Thank you very much, people. Keep well, and I'm sure somewhere on the way we'll meet again. Eh? It was a pleasure. Thank you.
Do you really SCCA students? The SCCA students. Thank you. 